Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Saturday class at Sunnyside again here. I'm Trevor, our general manager. So I had a Nicole. Good morning. She's in the background there. I get the pallet wall as usual here. Nicole's got the pretty plants. We were just talking today. We should have put a green screen up behind me and I could have had a swarm of ladybugs flying all around my head. That would have kind of been distracting, but, uh, but still fun. So thanks for joining us. Just a reminder, we got a handout way too long as usual. It's got uh, some little tips on there for you, some products. Like most classes with me, we're going to go fast and furious today. Organic gardening, we probably could have a week-long series on all kinds of different topics, so we'll try to go as much as we can. Uh, we're going to focus definitely on soil today, fertilizers, and then talk a few natural kind of organic cures and sprays as well. So we'll kind of focus with that. You're more than welcome to ask questions. Uh, we'll get to them at the end, answer some emails today, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever makes you happy, so we can do that as well. Um, I thought before we do a little slideshow, we just talk about a couple of basic things, you know, and maybe everybody's seen, you know, different organic certifications, you know, OMRI is the, the organic certification. So that means 100% organic. You'll see that on foods, you'll see it on nursery plants, you'll see it on just about everything. If it's gone through the process, you know, OMRI would be the national registration. You'll see quite a bit of E.B. Stone in particular, you know, probably our favorite organics company here. We stock their soils, their foods. It's a great family company in Northern California. You know, they are what's called CDFA. And I'll be honest, that goes to a whole nother level of certification. So California, most people probably read the news is the strictest of strict when it comes to most things in the world, uh, but in particular, uh, organic certification. So CDFA to me is even another level above OMRI. They get tested constantly. Every single dust speck that goes into any one of their products has been uh, ruled over and, and ensured that it's 100% organic. Um, you know, to me, you know, this class, yeah, I'm guessing because you tuned in today and you wanted to go to an organics class, you know, we'll give you some basics, but it's obviously that you're interested in that topic. So I'm going to make that assumption uh, as we're talking today. Um, you know, it's a choice, you know, it, it's hard sometimes when you look into your yard and you find something you, you can't really take care of unless we maybe reach for a little harsher product. Um, but it's a choice, you know, can you live with a little bit of this and a little bit of that? Do we use something natural, maybe applied a little bit more often? Um, you know, there's a lot of factors that will come into the decision, you know, for you. You know, I would start by saying this, you know, let's try to go green with edibles. And I'm talking vegetables, berries, fruit trees. You know, things that we're going to physically eat, you know, maybe you're trying to wean your way into the organic side of the world here. That would be a great way to start. You know, if you focus on the edible sides of the gardens and really stick with 100% organic there, I think you'll feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Everybody will be happy when they're when they're tasting your, your edibles um, and you know for sure there is no vanilla chemical in there at all. Um, you know, to me, you know, for my choice, one this years ago is you know i'm trying to create my little yard you know whatever it is you have you know a little environment that you're trying to keep you your pets your kids you know yes sometimes wildlife's a pain in the butt if we're going to be honest but we're trying to protect wildlife the birds you know all those things come into it when we use natural organic things we're going to have a healthy landscape you know pollinators is a huge part of this we'll talk about um, as we talk about some products towards the end um, you know, we'll start with the slideshow here in just a second, but it's going to deal with a lot of soil. And I don't care if I'm doing this class, roadie class, maple class, vegetable class, it really doesn't matter because when it comes down to it, soil is the key, key number one. I mean, you've got good quality soil, you've got microbes, you have fungi, you've got all the things you need in your ground or your container, you're going to have happy plants, you're going to have success. And that's what we always try to do here is yes, sell you a nice quality shrub, but also get you the proper organic amendment, the proper organic fertilizer so that that plant will thrive. If we've got great soil, you're gonna have success. So we're gonna really do a lot of soil today. Um, you know, some people may come up, well, how do I know where I'm at? You know, you know, I don't have a magic answer for that. Yes, you can contact a number of different analytical labs. You can have a soil test done. You can come in here and play, you know, play the science guy and grab this and I'll get a thermometer and I want to test for this and I got a pH meter, you know, you could do some of that. But if, if you really want to know what's in your ground, maybe you bought a, a new property or starting a garden area in the back 40 you haven't touched for a while. I don't, you know, whatever the case is, 
you know, it was certainly contacting an analytical company and perhaps analyzing the soil for contents of different trace minerals, NPK, and you know, all the different things that we need. That would be a place to start, you know, and then you can do some mending and adding as needed to, to get it to where you need to be, okay? So I'm gonna give you one second here and I'm gonna start my slideshow to go fast and furious. There's us in case you forgot, but you know, this little bit of this is a review from what we kind of talked about, you know, what's organic CDFA, you know, to me, it's what, you know, it's like everything, what you put into it's what you're going to get out of it. You know, and if you look for those two labels in particular, I mentioned Omri's one CDFA would be even stricter to me, you know, that's going to let me know that I have a, a material I'm using in my yard that is 100% certified organic, every single speck of dust when it comes to CDFA, I can tell you from the, from the, uh, from the lawmakers down there. Now, if you kind of look at this slideshow, again, these are recorded, you can go back and look at some funny little cartoon slides here, um, you know, if you want to go back and review. But again, this is just basic, basic soil chemistry, you know, organics, are going to support soil life. We don't have soil life. We're not going to have success growing anything. And this isn't just our yard. This is commercially um, all over the world when we talk about food crops and different things. You know, I need to support a healthy a soil life system. There's bacteria, there's fungi, all kinds of trace minerals. Earthworms are one of those super creatures that give us some fun things on the garden. You know, all of the all these good soil practices are going to promote a healthy ecosystem down below where we can't see. I could live without the mole, though. <laughs> um, here's kind of essentially, you know, we, you'll see in the sheet a little bit, a little blurb on composting, which we could probably have a whole separate seminar on someday. Um, you know, it, the key is finding that right balance between, you know, bacteria will digest green things, you know, grass clippings, leaves, things that decompose very quickly woody material that contains more carbon you know that's the job of the fun guy or the fungi we'll call it the fun guy because that's kind of fun to say in class so those are the those are the little guys the microbes that are going to break down our woody material and turn it into natural fertilizer employ you know empower our soil again to grow even better things but understanding kind of that green uh, versus brown ratio in your compost when you come by a quality a soil here at the nursery from EB Stone, that's been done for you. They've taken all this guesswork out of the, well, how many of that, how much of this do I put in and how much of that, you know, this is ready to go for all purpose when you come, when you come by a, a packaged soil. You know, mycorrhizae is one of those words that we won't make you spell. Um, it's been around now for a lot of years. I've been doing this about 30 and I think 20 years of this has been all about mycorrhizae. I kind of always chuckle if you're a, you know, sci-fi fan, think of, uh, Avatar, you know, the movie Avatar. What happens in Avatar, we look underneath the ground, a little, you know, fake movie, but essentially that's what it is. All these plants, the microbes, the fungi, everything is interconnected and mycorrhizae is the key in our soil for the majority of our plants. You know, we may look at a root system that's this big. What you don't see is it's 10 times larger than that. That, that mycorrhizae has attached itself to our tree's root system or shrub or perennial and it expands it out into the soil exponentially. That allows it to drop more water, be more drought tolerant. You know, we can go on and on um, of the benefit of mycorrhizae, but that is a great benefit of going organic. All of these soils, all these fertilizers have both endo and ecto mycorrhizae included in them, which again is gonna give you more success as an organic gardener. You know, a couple of things. We can't do much about the forest fire. Hopefully we don't have that in Western Washington, but I know there's people that have struggled with that in certain areas. You know, what's harmful to our soil? You know, over tilling and raking all the time. You, you can go back to the Dust Bowl, you know, in history in the Midwest, you know, a century ago where people figured out, wow, we cannot do it this way. We, we, we trialed, we erred. Now we have to go back to, the, to a different way of doing things where we have to improve our soil. We can't just keep planting the same things you know, we have to, 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 be, to take care of that, that earth. Um, high phosphorus fertilizers are huge, especially when it comes to lawns. You know, we don't need a lot of phosphorus except for particular, particular plants or particular times of the year. So again, buying a ready-made packaged appropriate fertilizer for that specific plant or type of plant that's organic is really gonna give you all you need and not give you the excess ingredients. 
you know, obviously overuse of pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, all that business is part of it. Um, you know, the things you can do to help, mycorrhizae is a huge help. You know, always use natural products. We'll talk about some natural pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, all that stuff here towards the end. And use diversity. I mean, the more different things you have in that garden, from tree to shrub to perennial to grass, you know, that's going to help with all this as well. You know, here in the, even in our little micro, micro climate here in Marysville, but I live across the, the valley in Everett and, and really all of Western Washington, you know, we've been blessed, I'll, I'll say it with a smile, with, you know, some clay, some glacial till. Some of us have a little sandy soil, a little bit of that in Marysville is almost half and half, but we've got to improve the structure. And, you know, when you're looking at adding a garden, planting a tree, whatever it is, you know, what do I have and, and how do I make it adequate for the new specimen I'm putting in. You know, compost is the magic ingredient to me always. There's always this behind my house. I use it for everything. And that's what's gonna help both ends of this is the compost degrades. It'll help break up your heavy clay, glacial till soil. Does that mean I can dig down six inches and plant a shrub and it's gonna be happy? No, we need to break that up, get it amended um, so that, that that tree shrub plant has got a, a good chance to start organically. The other side of this is sandy. You know, when we've got sandy soil, we can't water enough. You know, that water's gonna go straight through the structure and not be retained much. That compost will, will do the opposite with sandy. It'll help build some structure, hold some moisture, and allow me to have maybe a little less on the water bill in the summer as we're able to retain some more of that in the soil. You know, compost, you know, again, I think Evie Stone compost is the top of the list. I just did my entire yard. It was expensive by the bale. Uh, again last year um, but if I want to use compost versus bark there's other options for mulch um, you know compost is what's going to energize the soil again the micronutrients the microbes that's what's going to keep everything in balance there if we use compost in the planting hole as a mulch you know even mulching a new plant will make the, the world of difference um, using a good organic compost from EB Stone is the way to go you know that's got everything you need again mixed in there ready to, ready to rock you know, there's kind of an example of a planting hole. You know, if you're thinking, I'm going to start from this point forward going organic and I want to start doing the right way, getting the right soil mix in there. You know, there's a great little diagram, you know, on kind of how to dig out a basin and how to get that tree planted properly and get it a good start. You know, if I dig a little small hole, I use a pickaxe to get the clay out the edge and I've got this little bucket, it's going to hold too much water and that plant is going to want to sit there and grow in a circle and not go in to my native ground. So breaking that up in a nice wide hole, especially to me, and making sure I don't have that hard pan layer there is gonna give, give that, that plant a great start. You know, compost, perennials, vegetables, berries, roses, you know, there is no plant exempt from using compost to me. You're, you're gonna serve a lot of purposes from weed, but improving that soil health is huge. If I'm gonna energize, let's use the vegetable garden as an example, you know, I have small plots. Most people have little plots. You're probably getting into the time where some cold things are going in. We're waiting on tomatoes and things for a month or two until it gets warmer. But we want to re-energize that soil. It might be a little tired from last year. So getting a compost or one of the amendments we'll look at, we'll get that soil recharged. We add two, three inches down there, till it into the area, mix it in by hand, by trowel, by shovel, whatever you need. And that's going to re-energize that for another season of, of great success. You know, the, a big thing with the soils here, I'm hoping you'll take out of this is, you know, we have what we would call amendments, you know, things that I would add to my existing ground to improve it, the drainage, the nutrition, whatever it is. We also would have hybrid soils. So things that, yes, I can use as an amendment in an organic garden, or there are things I could use as a potting soil in an organic garden. So it's got everything I need, even if I put it in a pot, that plant will grow in there successfully long-term. Amendments, I cannot do that with. Be really careful about this difference. If I put some a, a, a new vegetable start that I'm doing straight into soil booster, it's gonna burn. That's got way too much chicken manure in there. And it's, it, it's made, made as an amendment. If I take that and add it to an existing soil and pop it in there, then I'm gonna be okay. So soil boosters, the one I use every year in my vegetable garden, in lieu of compost, I'll put that down, mix it in, and I've really got my soil energized. That's about 80% EB 
EV stove compost, 20% composted chicken manure. There's a couple extra little goodies in there too, but that's the main difference is I can really energize it with that additional chicken manure. You know, we used to call this super earthworm castings. They changed the label, but they should have kept it as the, he had a little cape on his back and he was flying like Superman because earthworm castings are one of those magic things. You're talking about micronutrients, all kinds of different things that really will help anywhere in the garden. A little bit of this goes a long ways. It makes me happy that uh, we've really, the last two, three years, a lot of people I think are discovering earthworm castings as one of those magical garden organic amendments. Again, I'm not planting an earthworm castings. There's no structure to it, but I could take this out and sprinkle it on my lawn. I could add it to my vegetable garden. A lot of these other mixes from UB Stone will have some of that as a benefit, but if you really want to kick in the power of the super earthworm, grab a little bag of earthworm castings. That is a wonderful amendment to use really in any garden situation. You know, topsoil is the one that's just a filler. You know, that one I have a couple bags around and usually it's the divot in the lawn. I had to move a plant. I need some soil um, to fill that hole in before I plant something new. Topsoil would be a sandy loam mix. Again, all organic mixed with a little bit of compost, but there's not the nutrition in this. This is kind of a filler thing. It's heavier, so it won't settle is the difference. I don't want to fill a huge hole in my yard with compost. It'll settle and degrade and I'll have a dip there. So this would be kind of a base mix soil that I could use. And then again, amend with soil booster, compost, one of the other amendments. You know, I use quite a bit of this rhododendron, azalea, camellia, the acid mix essentially is what it is. Um, this is for blueberries. It's for any acid loving plant, which covers, you know, probably two thirds of our gardens here uh, in our little climate. Uh, so again, a hybrid mix on this. This is something I grow blueberries in pots on my patio. I can use this as a potting soil and I can also use it as an amended compost to add into a, a planting hole where I'm putting a rhododendron or azalea or camellia or conifer, you know, anything that likes acidity, that's got a little extra sulfur in there, natural sulfur for the organic gardeners. It would be, a, again, a great hybrid type soil. You know, mulch, you know, is always an easy way. We'll talk talking about this tomorrow a little bit at weed class, um, but mulch is always a great way, again, to build health retain moisture, keep our microbes happy, um, you know, and, and, and help our soil out long term. You know, bark, you know, it's not the end of the world. I'm not going to, we're not going to hate you because you use bark, but bark's much woodier and takes time to turn into compost. If you want to skip that decomposition process and really energize it, compost would always be the superior mulch to me. You see in big letters there, I hate it when I see the the plastic mulches at, at uh, chain stores. Don't do the plastic mulch. You know, this is one I struggle with, the, the OCD gardener here. You know, you got to find that fine line as, a, as an organic gardener between, you know, kind of natural and maybe OCD on my end. You know, how much leaves do you leave down? How much clutter do you leave in the winter? You know, all this again will add nutrients and natural way to the soil as it decomposes but I struggle with looking out and seeing little piles of this and that. So I try to do some and not other areas in my own yard, but you kind of can find that, uh, that balance for yourself between the neat and the natural. Um, certainly leaving some leaves down and turning that over every year um, is a big help. I've kind of went to taking my, some of my leaf debris that's bothering me, moving it to somewhere, will it use, will it contained in an area then I can use it as a winter kind of mulch, turn it over in the spring and add it to my vegetable garden or some other areas. Um, you know, there's again, a few benefits of mulch and we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about that tomorrow. Just keep in mind, again, the asterisk there, if I use a woodier type mulch, you know, it helps with moisture, weeds, a lot of these things, but I'm not adding much to my soil right away. If I'm using a finer compost type mulch, I'm doing all those the things the bark does but I'm also adding in the, the nutrients as well. You know, top coat is just a finer graded compost. Those for your lawns. I have, I use a little bit of this in my vegetable garden if I want something a little finer, um, but top coat would be kind of a screened compost. It's identical to the EV stone organic compost, but a little bit smaller particle size. So a little less woody if you like something real fine. Uh, potting soil, same thing. You know, we use all organic potting soils. Uh, here, when we plant stuff, 
in our containers. This is our mix that we use in our own greenhouse. It's what our staff uses. You know, I think it's probably the best all-purpose potting soil, indoor, outdoor, anything on the market. Um, certainly it can be used, um, you know, planting your annuals. We're getting close to that now. This is not something I ever use as an amendment digging into the ground. You want compost or one of the amendments for that. Potting soil is for a pot, compost is for the ground. You know, this is kind of your connoisseur. They call it, uh, they, they, some of the areas of the country, I uh, call it recipe 420. I'll let you figure that one out for yourself. Uh, ultimate recipe is what we call it here. It's the same blend. Um, this is the connoisseur, the creme de la creme of the potting soils. If I'm going to buy Edna's Best and add yucca extract and a little extra of this and a little extra of that, you know, this is the top of the line. You're a little more expensive a bag. But this is frankly what I put my tomatoes in and some of the vegetables, if I do them in containers, this is the, the superior potting soil blend. Again, you put, get what you get, whatever you put into it. So if you use this, I think you're going to see a definite difference in growth. It's, a, you know, Edna's, there's nothing wrong with Edna's, but this is uh, Edna's on steroids, we'll call it. Natural steroids, mind you. <laughs> a succulent mix, uh, something we use for, for gritty cactus indoor outdoor again um you know i grow some agaves and some things in pots outside of my house this is what i use in lieu of any kind of potting soil i want a grittier rockier sandier mix the water is going to go right through uh that would be something to consider for those situations organically you know seed starting mix same way you know if i go buy organic seeds you know even organic or you know or non-gmo vegetable starts you know, don't go buy garbage soil to plant them in and get them started. If you're going to go organic, go organic. You know, get a really good quality seed starting mix from E.B. Stone. Get those little puppies started out, and then you can transfer them into the garden here down the road. You know, this is one that's a lot of peat, a lot of core, and it's going to really drain well, but it's a great mix uh, for starting out those, those, those vegetables. You know, here's the, our, our, one of our best selling soils here these days with everybody loving edibles is raised bed mix. It's exactly that. I got a raised garden. I got a container. I raised even wood off the ground. What do I fill it with uh, that's all organic? Uh, raised bed mix is the way to go. This is what I set mine up with a long time ago. And now I get my soil booster every year to re-energize it. But raised bed mix is, again, the hybrid soil. I can use that as an amendment. If I want to mix that into my existing garden, or if I'm starting brand new and want to fill that big container or fill that raised garden, this is what I can go straight in, plant, and I'm good to go. You know, if we do a little fertilizers real quick, you know, here's kind of the essence of a plant, you know, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Those are the three ingredients that we see on all fertilizer packages. Um, of all kinds. I've got three numbers on there. Those are the three, nitrogen, potassium, uh, potassium and, or phosphorus and potassium. If you kind of think of it this way, you know, nitrogen, we kind of go up, the potassium, we kind of go down and the, and the, the and, or the phosphorus down the, and the potassium's all around, if you want to think of it that way. You know, growth is going to be from nitrogen, leaves, uh, certainly some other things. Phosphorus tends to give us more bud bloom production when it comes to vegetables, fruits, berries, potassiums, again, all the way around, healthy root system, healthy stems, healthy, healthy everything. So watch your numbers on there. You'll see again, organics, as we look through these, much lower in numbers, but they're going to work much better. So if we look at kind of the basics here, you know, organic versus synthetic, you know, if I've got an organic fertilizer, again, all certified organic, carbon-based, I like them because, especially in our neck of the woods, we get a lot of rain certain times of the year, not so much in the summer, but, you know, fall, winter, spring, we're pretty wet. Synthetics will always tend to leach out of the soil much quicker. The organics are going to bind in the soil structure much easier. So I'm going to have it last longer. The plant's going to love it. It's going to take a little longer to activate. It's not, you know, the quick synthetic food, but that's why we try to feed organically here in February. And again, in May or June, because if I do it in February, I'm ready to go. As soon as these plants wake up, I do it in May or June. Now I've got that nice gentle dose to last through the summer into the fall for all the summer production. So a great way to go, using it less often. And again, all the extra stuff in the organics, the mycorrhiza, the microbes, um, all the micronutrients. These are things you're not going to find 
in a, in a typical synthetic fertilizer. You know, lawn food, number one thing with me, you know, if I could ban some stuff on earth, it would be weed and feeds and synthetic lawn food. I'm sure everybody reads the news and sees what happens, especially if we live on the river, the stream, the lake, the sound, um, all that extra phosphorus, especially in those synthetic foods is going in for algae bloom and water. We want a quality organic fertilizer that we use less, less often. You will not beat Nature's Green from E.B. Stone. I think that's the best food on the market. It's what I use, the main one we sell here. Um, this is the way to go naturally. Again, the pets, the wildlife, you, your kids, all that stuff's gonna be much happier with an organic lawn food. Yes, it smells wonderful for a day or two, but as soon as it washes into the ground, you don't have that have that organic smell for, for too long. You know, if you look at lawn foods, you know, and a couple of tips, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're going organically, you know, it doesn't really matter what organic lawn food brand you might like. The key number is that one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. I see some other brands around that kind of tell you it'll grow up to 5,000 square feet. Well, actually, it's got the same amount of nitrogen as our little 2,000 square foot bag of EV stone does. It's going to do the same thing. But it, because it's a little bigger, it says it on there, it makes you feel like it goes longer. Look at the nitrogen content per weight. That is all that matters when it comes down uh, to, the, to, the, to the lawn is nitrogen, one pound per thousand square feet, each dose you do. You know, certainly mowing taller, watering deeper, especially in the summer. Lime is a great way to go. We've got organic lime around here. Recycle your clippings, don't do it. That would kind of be up to you, but these are all practices um, that would certainly help your lawn organically. So the fertilizers, again, ecto, endo, mycorrhizae, you know, am I benefiting the plant? Not all plants have, need mycorrhizae. It's not going to hurt any plants, but all plants don't need it. There's some that certainly uh, get a huge benefit from having it. All these fertilizers are going to have that in there, whether we're talking sure start, you know, tomato vegetable food will be a much higher in calcium, which again is going to be better for the vegetables, better for you, and frankly, fend off some disease with that higher calcium content. Um, Rhodia azalea camellia has got built in sulfur for all the acid loving plants. And this includes blueberries. Um, you could use this on the majority of your yard, I'll tell you right now. Um, rose food's another one. If you've got perennials and roses, get that rose food because this has got some alfalfa meal and some extra goodies in there that are going to really benefit blooming perennials, blooming roses, things that we want consistent color out of. And then you've got some trace element things like alfalfa meal. We'll see a couple others, maybe bio meal, blood meal. There's all kinds of simples, we would call them. You know, maybe you're the organic connoisseur and you're going to come down and buy your own boxes and make your own little special fertilizer great you know there's a lot of great ways to make your own i think the benefit of eb stone is kind of having it all done in the right ratios for you ready to go but alfalfa meal is kind of one of those things um, i do it on my roses every year it would benefit a lot of other plants as well but in particular roses you know we've got some things in alfalfa meal that aren't in typical organic fertilizers you can see on the list there some different trace minerals, um, even some growth hormones that are found naturally in alfalfa meal. You know, these are things that will truly benefit the rose or, or, or certainly all flowering plants. Fruitberry vine food, same way. You'll see the numbers vary a little bit on these different fertilizers, but all those same benefits. If I'm growing, you know, from grapes to kiwis to any kind of fruit tree, um, this is the way to go, strawberries even. The one, di the one exception would be the blueberry. I wanna make sure that gets a little more acidity so we go for that rhododendron fertilizer. Ultra Bloom, you know, I put this in my pots, I put it in my dahlias. I use this a lot in planting time in spring because this is no nitrogen. It is just 10% phosphorus, 10% potassium. This is gonna help me with bud and bloom and root structure. So when I plant my annual pots, window boxes, again, put dahlias in the ground, other bulbs. This will be a great way, again, to maximize my flower power. And then again, like I mentioned, some of the single ingredients. We don't carry all of these, because um, again, I think all the fertilizers kind of have them in there for you, um, but certainly bone meal would be one I'd mention. That's a favorite of the bulbs. We always have bone meal around. That would serve again as a, as a phosphorus source for bud and bloom uh, on, on your bulbs as you plant them.
you know, minerals, pH, lime. You know, you can see again, kind of the chart up there. We, we're kind of on the acidic side to neutral. Very few of us have got any kind of alkaline. We go east of the mountains. It's the opposite. We're going to be on the alkaline side of soil. Um, but there's pH adjusters that we can utilize. You know, sulfur is a great organic compound to go more acidic. Agricultural lime is a great way to go more alkaline. You know, there's some options when it comes to that without, again, having to go to a, a synthetic product. You know, even liquids, you know, this is one I use again, feeding in my, my, uh, my planters and such during the course of the year um, is, is a, a fish based or liquid organic fertilizer. Some it's easier, put a little bit in my watering can, swish it around and water with that food instead of having to get granular out, I'm gonna do that consistently. And certainly when it comes to hanging baskets, container gardens and things, as we go through the growing season, we wanna keep them looking fresh and keep them blooming strong using you know, a liquid like this every couple of weeks um, is really going to accomplish that for us. So there's a quick little run through. There's our email um, you know, on website. You can always access some information on there as well. I'm going to spend a few minutes here kind of showing you. There we go. All right. So we're going to show you a few. Now, if you look at that, the hand out there, there's quite a bit of stuff on there, and I'm going to show you a few here so we stay under an hour, Nicole. I don't want her getting me today. Um, and if you just kind of follow that hand out, we, we talk about a couple main subjects, that I think there are some good organic um, natural type products that you could utilize to accomplish the same result as maybe getting a chemical, okay? I will start by saying this, you know, before we get into talking about sprays, uh, herbicides, all these different organic things we're going to talk about, you know, you know, keep in mind the pollinators. When it comes down to it, you know, I could sell you the safest thing in the world, neem oil, insecticidal soap, whatever it is. If I spray that on my bee, I'm still going to do damage to the bee. So you, it, this isn't just about choosing maybe the right thing. It's about getting the right practices when it comes to being an organic gardener. Timing, get up early, get up late in the day when the bees are active. Don't spray flowers. You know, it's hard sometimes to, to accomplish some of that, but if you're careful, you can do it. And I just want to make that clear. I'm always going to read the label. I'm always going to use the right amount. And even on organic stuff, I'm going to be real careful when I spray. You know, you could look online, I'm sure, and find out if I, if I cover my bee in neem oil, it's, it's going to do the same damage as it is to one I do want to kill. And we all want to save the bees. So, so I'll start by saying that. Be careful with pollinators. And just because we're doing the right thing and choosing something organic doesn't necessarily mean, oh, look at the bees and ladybugs and everybody else, let's spray it all. No, we want to get it on the plant foliage, not the flowers, and, 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 and get the problem corrected, okay? So if we look at a couple of weed control things real quick, you know, we're going to deal with weeds tomorrow, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But there are some natural things you can do. You know, we would call it a pre-emergent herbicide. If I've weeded an area... I don't want some things to grow. Yes, there's a lot of chemical options out there. There's not much organic options out there. We can get recycled newspaper or burlap. I don't know if anybody wants to walk out and look in their front yard and see you know, newspaper and burlap laying across the ground all year. That's probably not the answer. Maybe for an area we're trying to kill the weeds and go back and fix later, absolutely. But if I've cleaned an area and I'm gonna put mulch down or compost down, yes, those things will help with weeds. But I'm going to find something like corn gluten. You know, this is something I've used a number of times over the years. I tend to do it in spring and fall. But if I get corn gluten, that's all organic, OMRI certified, you know, and that hits my soil level and rain, it's going to dissolve. It makes a film on the soil. And it does a really pretty good job at keeping most weeds from popping up after you clean an area. It's not going to kill a weed that's there. I want to make sure that's clear but it's a pretty good one at preventing it from coming back. It's not going to last a year, probably won't last half a year, but if we do this in spring, when we're getting into the rainy season, we'll help with the pop weed, all the stuff that's going crazy right now. And then we do it in the fall, we're not going to have as much stuff of that come up, okay? So for me, I'll put that down, mulch over the top of it, but I'm not going to put that in my vegetable garden. I'm not going to put that in my lawn because then my lawn seed won't grow. So it is a, 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 it is a pre-emergent. If we want to go spot spray, you know, post-emergent herbicide, they've got fancy new names here. So I thought I'd bring them in because I'm getting used to it too. But 
This is our Captain Jack's Lawn Weed Brew. And that's a, just a fun thing to say. This is used to be called Weed Beater FE. It's the same exact product. That is a natural lawn herbicide that will kill weeds and moss, honestly, but not harm, harm turf grass. You know, grass is able to absorb a massive amount of iron, turn dark black green and not perish. The weed cannot absorb that much iron. So as a natural weed killer, that's a superior one to go with in the lawn. Out in the driveway, the garden beds, the vegetable garden, everywhere else, we would get dead weed brew from Captain Jack's, kind of similar look. I brought this in because I thought this was pretty slick. Comes with a little battery sprayer. You don't even have to pump it anymore. And you can just fill this again with concentrate. <clears throat> so if we buy this, you know, now I can go out, spray the cracks in my driveway, my gravel pathway. If I'm careful, I can use it in my garden. It's still an herbicide, it's all natural, but I'm not gonna spray that on my vegetable starts or my peony plant or something else because you will burn that too. Um, so that would be an option for, for kind of a, a, a post-emergent herbicide. Now, if we go to the second one there, the moss. Everybody's got that evil creature. It's crawling everywhere here in the Northwest coming out of winter. Um, yeah, there's a lot of options for moss. Um, I'm always worried about staining when I use heavy iron products. They're very effective um, and not chemical based if it's just ferron iron sulfate. But if you're gonna go natural, we would get a liquid moss killer like Moss Max. This comes in a little spray bottle. I go to my hose, I spray my moss in my lawn. I spray the moss in my flower bed real carefully. I don't get this on plants. Um, this is a great solution for mosses, lichens, algae, kind of all those other little plant creatures. Uh, in our garden. So I can use that everywhere, be really careful about plants. This is something in the winter, I could even spray it on the bark of my apple tree if I'm tired of looking at the pretty moss growing in the branches here and there. You can do that as well, but not in the growing season. I wanna make sure that's clear. Do not go out there now, we have leaves on and spray this on your tree. You wanna do it in the winter and we can still use it at the soil level or on the lawn this time of year, okay? Now slug control, it's always about iron phosphate. You know, probably most people have seen Sluggo brand. Got this on special for the class today, this nice jug of slug, slug bait. But this is the one, again, Omri listed, not gonna kill birds, pets, wildlife, us, anybody else. It's not old murder, death, kill, metal aldehyde. This is the natural way to get slugs. So I get iron phosphate out there early and often you will win against those slugs and snails. It's got a great attractant, but get it on now. It's why we're always trying to push slug in the spring. Don't come to me in June and say, what do I do now? I've eaten half my cone flower to the ground. All right, well, we can kill the slug, but the damage is done. You know, we want to get it up as these plants are coming out of the ground. Get your little circle, your wall, your moat, your shield, whatever you want to call it. Get it around there so they never get in there in the first place um, and you can get it. So iron phosphate, um, diatomaceous earth I brought in. That's another option. Uh, that does quite a bit of different insects, not just slugs. That's something that's popular with some people. Um, and this particular one I thought I'd show from Boni. This we call bug and slug killer. So this is iron phosphate, but it's also got spinosad or spinosad in it, which is a great ground insect killer that's certified organic. Um, we'll talk about spinosad in a minute, but that would be one that I'd kind of get two products in one out of, okay? Now, mold control. I think Mr. Smith might have showed up there, so he'll probably uh, have something to say about the moles. But, you know, moles are always a kind of a fun one because they're not stupid. Well, they are kind of dumb compared to us. But it, if you look at a mole, you know, what works for he might not work for she and for him next door. I mean, moles are just kind of a weird little creature. I would always start by trying a good repellent like Mole Max. You know, if you're going to try to send him to the neighbor's yard, you know, get some mole max down. This isn't again a natural thing. It's just it's just castor oil. No, you can't go buy a bottle of castor oil to store and spray it on your grass. It's not the same thing. This is a specially granulated one. I can drop it in a spreader, and I hopefully will get the mole to move out and head to the neighbors. I think is the key. Sorry, neighbor. Um, but the trick with mole max is, you know, put it where they're active. Wait a week, then go out another third, wait a week, then go out to the edge. If you cover your whole lawn or your garden bed, wherever your mole or vole is doing damage, he's got nowhere to go. Everywhere he goes, he's gonna smell that castor oil and he'll probably stay put right where he's at. 
So try to get him to say, hey, head this way, then that way, and then boom, hopefully he's next door at Mrs. Jones, and you can just sprinkle it around the edge of your property, and maybe he will not come back in. The other option is the spikes. Now these, I've heard huge mixed results. You could try them out. This is a, a battery powered one. I don't think we have solar enough to last these the whole year here. So battery powers we put in, this just goes into the soil and just chatters a little bit. It's an irritating sound, usually to moles and voles. Maybe they head to the neighbors. You know, I've had some people say these were gold. They got rid of their mole, put these along the property line. They've never seen them since. I have other, other people come back in and say, gee, thanks, Trev. I bought that, put it in the ground. The mole dug it up where his next hill was. So, you know, it might be something to try, um, but just again, one of those more natural, you know, kind of organic ways to try to manage the, the mole population in the garden. Now, insects and disease, how am I doing on time? I'm doing great today, Nicole. I'm going to make it. So if we look at some insects and diseases, you know, I put quite a few on the list there. You know, this is something, you know, that, that me, our staff, um, the ownership here is always monitoring, you know, what do we carry? What do we offer for our customers? It's really hard as a retailer. You know, we, we everybody would love to say, we got no chemicals here whatsoever. You know, it's all 100% organic. You know, maybe someday we get to that point. We've got very few non-organic solutions. I'll tell you right now, they're for very specific issues. You know, we are a business, so I, I have to, you know, kind of cover all of our bases. How's that for, for an honest answer? But, you know, again, it's this is a class about your choice. You know, do you want to choose natural, safe things? Absolutely. You know, we've got something around here to kind of take care of most of your yard issues going that way. Um, if you start kind of looking at the list there, you know, there's quite a bit to kind of salivate over. So I brought a number of here. We probably can't show them all, but I thought I'd whip through a few you know, in some of the classes already, you've heard me talking about, we'll start reaching for bottles here. Monterey horticultural oil. You know, this is the new style oil here the last few years that is 100% certified organic. This is what to use as a dormant spray, I would say, number one. But again, read your labels and it will tell you, you can use it for a whole bunch of other things as well. I can tell you that one says, don't spray when it's 90 degrees outside. So. I could take horticultural oil out. And if I'm careful, I spray in the morning, I spray late in the day, I do the right thing. You know, I could utilize this during the growing season as well on a lot of plants. So it's not just a dormant spray, but something we can use um, a little bit during the season as well. If we look at uh, Captain Jack's dead bug brew, you know, I, I appreciate bone eye as kind of our main, you know, garden solutions, the pharmacy, whatever you want to call it. They're our main supplier. You know, it's a good company back east. They've got some great natural options and we tend to gravitate towards them more than anybody. Um, I like the fact they've kind of taken all this natural stuff and put the funny guy with, with the hat on, the Captain Jack. You saw it on the, the new herbicide bottles. This is the same little straw hat guy you're gonna see on a lot of different things in the store. The big thing with me, whatever it is, you're going to see a, a brown shoulder, we call it. Always these natural things are going to have this label, every single one of them in the, in the store there. And you're going to see his little smiling tropical hat there. That'll kind of let you know, okay, I'm getting some Captain Jack's product of one kind or another. That's going to do the job and stay on the natural side. So Captain Jack's a good way to go. Apple maggots, you know, they're coming out here pretty quick. You know, if you've got some hours and you've got time, We've got, I call them the little pantyhose. You got the little pantyhose for your apples. You know, these come in a box. We should dump this out. I'd have a mess to clean up. But you got little tiny little pantyhose. Your apples get to about nickel size. I could sit there and tie a little maggot barrier on all my fruit. They look kind of funny hanging in the tree, but you have to keep that fly from laying her larva in your apple here at some point. This has become a pretty, it's been a problem for decades around Washington. Um, there's a lot of apple maggot quarantine areas still on the east side of the state, but this is a, a little creature I can't spray. There's, there's nothing, there's no way I'm going to catch every fly every day as they come in to lay more eggs. So we've got to get something like a, bear, a, a barrier on them or get a trap with a lure, kind of a pheromone lure that I will get that fly to go to my apple and get stuck and then you can catch her. So we'll have the, we'll have the traps in here pretty quick as well. Uh, Revitalize you know, is the main fungicide. This one always sounds funny because you can see on the bottle there it says biofungicide. That sounds like something we might have at Hanford, you know, nuclear site. 
it's the opposite. You know, this is our biofungicide, the natural way to go. Maybe in past years, you saw products like Serenade, you know, always came in a pink bottle. I used that for years. This is kind of the, the new Serenade. It's a little higher, heavier concentration. All this is, is a, is a solution of make this easy fungus eating bacteria. You know, it's a couple of bacillus strains in a sugar solution that keeps them alive till you use it. I can put that on anything, my vegetable garden, my lawn, anything I'm worried about disease, that's a spray that I can use on my entire landscape. And again, not have something with chemical. That's a totally natural bacillus solution that will take care of a lot of diseases. Again, you come in here in July and say, my rose is covered in black spot. Give me the biofungicide. Yeah, it'll help. It'll keep it probably from getting worse. It's not going to make it go away. The key with this organic side of this discussion today is staying proactive. If, I'm, if I know I have a plant like a rose that is going to be prone to disease, get the biofungicide on there now as it leaves out. Get on a schedule and you will never have the problem. That, that's hopefully a part of the, the point we realized today. Okay, Root weevils. You know, that's that little evil creature that lives in our soil and comes up and notches our little rhododendrons and laurels and all kinds of plants at night. Again, not something you're going to be able to catch. Yes, you can spray. You've got to go to a synthetic or murder, death, kill product, which we're not talking about today. So if I want to try to go organic with root weevils, um, what you've got to do is get in with the tangle foot. So this is always fun. I get to bring a jar of something in. I'll open this. It's kind of fun. Ooh, look at that. Looks like Vaseline, essentially. But this is... This is a useful thing for those little crawling insects. If I've got an old rhododendron, I've got trunks at the ground level. If I get some tree wrap or barrier and I band those trunks and I take that tangle foot and I smear it all around that, guess what? That little guy doesn't have anywhere to crawl up on my rhododendron to, to feed that night. So you walk out a few days later and you're like, yes, I caught like 10 of them. And they're kind of fun to look at. Root wheels are kind of a cool bug. But that way you catch them. I mean, that's the, the way we're going to try to do it organically. And again, avoid the spraying. If we look at caterpillars, you know, no one should ever get a flamethrower, a gasoline can, or something chemical to get a caterpillar. That's one of the first things that came out years ago is a really uh, ecological solution, a natural way to go with caterpillar death. You want BT. You know, we saw a lot of this on the years of the caterpillar, who we'll see what happens this year. But it's a great killer for caterpillar-like insects. If I'm, if this is BT again, a natural bacillus, I spray that on a plant. That caterpillar takes a bite of that, gets sick to their stomach. They don't eat anymore. They don't reproduce, and you win. Yeah, it's not going to make the caterpillar nest go poof and vanish, but they're kind. It's kind of fun to spray it on a little tent caterpillar nest and see them in there twitching as they ate it, and then wow, nothing's crawling anymore. I won. So then you you, you win against the caterpillars as well. Uh, neem oil is the big one. You know, everybody wants neem oil. Um, and I would agree. I mean, neem oil is a, a really good all-purpose spray for organic gardeners, not just for bugs, for disease, for mites, for all of it. You know, that is probably the ultimate three-in-one uh, killer to have around neem oil. Again, like I mentioned earlier, this is the one probably that drives me crazy with the, the folks with the flowers and the roses and things. I can't go out and spray my bees or anything with neem oil. You're going to cut them off. You're going to kill the bee too. So timing is everything and using it often. You know, if I'm going to try to control all this stuff with neem oil, again, proactive. I start early. I get this on on a regular basis. You know, if you want to be super OCD neem oil style, you're going to go probably every two weeks to a month and you're going to start here in spring and just continue to apply it. Um, it's a great all-purpose killer, easy to spray liquid form, and it does a lot of different creatures and, and diseases as well. So the, the confusing part with neem oil now, it probably didn't exist a few years ago, is, is the different forms you can find it in. Um, it's always going to be natural. Uh, many of the companies will pay for certification and have it labeled OMRI, but neem oil is always going to be natural. You know, we have regular neem oil which we've had for years and we'll probably still carry it until everybody discovers the new form, which is called Neem Max. Now, if you're going to come down and buy something and try this, just get the Neem Max because this is the next generation, I think, of neem oil products. 
A, it's 70% concentration versus 30 on typical neem oils. It's cold pressed, which just means there's never been any chemical additive, anything in the whole entire process, uh, which is very unique, um, even for natural, natural products as they're made. But Neem Max is going to do everything neem oil does. You're just going to use less of it and you're going to spend, you're going to spend less money because with the concentration rate, this is going to go a lot longer in my yard. Uh, this is a great houseplant product too. This is the one thing we do in our houseplant product, uh, houseplant area as a preventative, as things get delivered, um, our plants get scrubbed down with Neem Max or and Neem Oil, now it's Neem Max to ensure that hopefully you get to take home a healthy specimen for the house. The other one's Bond Neem. And this is no different, except again, it's got neem oil, but a couple extra on the range of that biofungicide. So again, neem oil with a little bit more in it. I think in the future, you're going to see this at a place like Sunnyside and neem max, and probably not as much of the old school uh, neem oil down the road, but all three great products. Uh, what else do I got here? Ooh, insecticidal soap. I think that's the last one here. And now it's called super insecticidal soap. So again, the difference is with this is with these natural organic solutions that we talk about, you know, they used to be insecticidal. Everybody has probably heard of insecticidal soap. You can almost make it at your house sometimes. Look online. You can find this and that. Oh, I could make a little bottle of that myself. It's similar, not quite the same. It'll work if you do it right. But this, the difference with this super soaps now it's not just that soap, but it's extra ingredients in there. So like this particular one, we've got the natural potassium soap that will do a great number of insects, but we've also got spinosad or spinosad mixed in there, which is again, a good organic natural killer um, of a lot of creatures as well. So there's kind of these combo products. Again, I can see the brown. It's a natural thing that I'm going to feel comfortable with as an organic gardener um, in the store there. But again, takes care of more things probably than just using the, the regular insecticidal soap, okay? You'll see the last couple things on there. You know, people actually haven't started calling as much for ladybugs yet. They're not quite ready yet. We're getting pretty close. Um, you know, you could look online. There's a lot of beneficial insects. Um, a lot of growers that we use um, utilize some of that in their greenhouses and things for pest management. That's a great way to go in lieu of spraying as well. I put nematodes on that list for the first time this year. I think we're probably gonna to try to get some in here to sell. My issue with nematodes, um, that's a little beneficial that lives in the soil um, that would take care of root weevil larva for one um, and some other things. It's always been the climate up here and I never felt comfortable selling folks nematodes that I never thought would live through the winter. You know, they can migrate down in the soil structure to a deeper depth and not freeze. I just never felt comfortable with some of the original strains that they would live year to year to year. I was always like, well, great. Why would you buy that? Use it in your garden. Just when we get enough growing and bigger and hatching to do some damage, then winter hits and they're gone. And I got to start over again next spring, you know, if that makes sense. So I think now I'm doing some more investigating at some shows last year. I think they're different strains of nematodes, I think will work a little better up here. This is an absolute California thing for sure. Where we don't have as much of the seasonality, but I think we'll be able to take advantage of it here in Washington now as well. Um, you'll see some funny stuff on there. You know, watching praying mantis hatch and, and kill each other is kind of fun. You can find those two. Uh, lace wings are one we thought about bringing in. We may at some point, that's another little kind of predatory insect that doesn't harm anything but goes and attacks aphids and, and other issues in the garden as well. Um, you know, my suggestion would be this, if you wanna have some fun, especially if you've got kids, like I got two little boys, ladybugs are awful fun to watch fly around and release. So, you know, start with that, you know, try a little can of ladybugs, they're not super expensive. Wait till it warms up a bit, release those in the yard. Yes, some of them will go to the neighbors and, and say goodbye to you, but they'll hang out. If you've got some little creatures to eat, they'll find them and, and that's their nourishment. So they'll, they'll help you out in the bug end uh, doing that as well, okay? The last thing on there is composting. We could have a hour long seminar on composting. I'm sure maybe someday we'll do a composting seminar too, but, but uh, I would encourage you to look online, um, look at some information. There's a lot of great websites from the city, your local city to the county, wherever you are everybody wants you to compost, whether it's dumping it all in the bin, 
recycling it with your you know local municipality and doing it that way or making your own compost getting a tumbler getting a bin built whatever your thing is um there's a lot of options out there on on kind of making your own compost as well and recycling some of this stuff okay all right I'm, let me see i didn't look at my my phone for a while yes i made it nicole that was a lot so just real quick um you know again i mentioned it a couple times you know, I, I'm not a huge internet guy. I take advantage of it now, an old internet. I'm starting to get into it. But just be real careful what you read. You know, I try to stick to the university sites, county agencies, Master Gardener, you can go on and on, who's going to give you good information. I've seen a lot of junk on there, too, that probably isn't necessarily all true. So, but do some exploring on the internet. You know, there's a lot of information on this stuff on there, especially when it comes to composting and all the business that we, we kind of just touched on today. Um, you know, again, our specials for the class, we're always running a couple great specials for folks. Um, you know, we want to sell you success at Sunnyside when it comes down to it. We got great plants, we got quality plants. Yes, we try to get certified organic vegetables. Not everybody has them. We do all we can to get as much as we can. We've got certified seeds in the store, um, mixed, you know, mix of this and that from a number of different companies. Um, all our vegetables start to be non-GMO, which is a huge thing. Um, a lot of companies just won't pay to have the certification done. So it doesn't mean, I can tell you right now, none of our growers have applied any systemic chemicals or anything like to any of the starts we get in. It's just to have everything tested from soil level to start to seed to all of it is a little overwhelming for some of the smaller little niche growers uh, that do some of the vegetables. So yes, there's some organic in everything else I would still feel safe telling you it's natural, not been treated with anything. You take home and get the organic foods and all that on there as well. So for specials, we got we got Sluggo, the big two and a half pound jugs. If you live around here, you need Sluggo to take care of your slugs and snails. They are coming, they're already out and they are gonna get worse here as we get into spring. So come take advantage of the sale. You got that for $14.99, two and a half pound jug is a great price on iron phosphate. Typically here it's 20 bucks. I think it's even more at some of the other stores as well. So that's a great sale price. And then we made this real easy because we want to sell you success with fertilizers. All organic fertilizers here are 20% off through Friday. So if you were a smart organic gardener, I think that's what I would be down here to get right away. Oh, sweet. I'll get my lawn food for later. I got this. I got my rose. I got my liquid. Stash it, hoard it, put it in the garage. It doesn't go bad but you can come down and take advantage. 20% is a great discount um, on really good quality EV stone organic fertilizers. And also you'll read in the sheet, Espoma is another great organic company that we're getting in a little bit more in every year. And they have got a great liquid line. I can't hold three, so I'll show you grow, bloom, and we're getting into that time, tomato. So those are all really easy kind of cap applications I can Fill my cap, unscrew it, put it in my watering can, keep the plant watered, and you're getting a good water soluble organic. Those are 20% off as well. Um, next class, tomorrow, if you're not bored already by me today, we're doing weed control tomorrow. So we're going to talk all about weeds. Yes, we will talk about the organic things. We will also talk about some chemical options again and let the, let the students make their choice. But we'll talk about everything weeds tomorrow, brush killers and all kinds of things on how to kind of manage that here in spring. And then I'm back two weeks. I will be doing double classes again, Saturday and Sunday. A couple of my faves are coming up. Japanese maples was my very first plant addiction. We'll be uh, doing, I'll be doing Japanese maple class uh, coming on the 9th of April, a Saturday at 10. And then that Sunday, we kind of added this a couple of years ago. And I think it's a great class for gardeners just called Colorful Shrubs which kind of sounds a little boring, but it's not. We're gonna go and delve into a lot of the fun other shrubs besides hydrangeas and roses and roadies and azaleas and all the things we have specific classes for. This will kind of be all the other fun stuff that you can choose from for the garden. And we'll do <coughs> some spring blooms, some summer blooms, some fall color, a little bit of everything, uh, doing a slideshow to show you some, some other fun, fun shrubs to consider as well, okay? So I'll just say this, you know, we had a little drizzle this morning. I don't think it's going to rain all day. Come up, say hi. Uh, the place is looking beautiful. We got some nice stock in. It looks like a nursery now. Always by the 1st of April, we're kind of getting packed. Uh, there's still some things to come, uh, but there's plenty of great quality plants up here to choose from. We've got great staff to come talk to. 
um, and certainly come up and chat about uh, organic gardening, all you like to here after the class, okay? So what do we got left? Mr. Smith, get them on the cold or do we got any left here? Um, no, we've got some good ones. So um, just a reminder, all those sales that he mentioned start today and they go through Friday the 1st. Um, so you've got some time, but you know, not forever. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and that Japanese maple class that you mentioned, that's going to be sponsored by the Everett Clinic, which is always a fun, uh, fun thing because we get to give away gift cards. So hopefully you can join us for that. Um, so we talked about a lot of products. I know there's been some questions here in the chat about things. Um, in no way are you kind of stuck to use just these products. These are products that we believe in. We use um, both here in the nursery and individually at our homes. Um, you know, in EV Stone, I know that uh, Trevor went through a wide selection of EV Stone products. Um, there are other great organic solutions out there. Again, you know, he mentioned looking for the OMRI or the, I always trip this one up, CDFA. I always get flipped in Depart the middle. I always remember because it's Department of Department. Food and Agriculture. Right. Um, <laughs> Basically, if you look for things with those labels, there's lots of other choices for you. You don't have to, you know, just buy into the things that we're recommending. These are just things that we have here in the store that we believe in and, you know, um, carry because we believe in those products. So, so don't feel like you're locked in just to EV Stone um, or Bonite or whatever. They're just great solutions that we know will work for you, which is always a plus. Um, there was question about something that maybe is a little bit more um, economic and cost effective than um, EV Stone. Do you have have any other recommendations? Well, for price, mm -hmm. I mean, or, organic, you know, organic fertilizers, I hate to say, is always going to be a little bit more than this, a cheap synthetic fertilizer. I mean, again, you're paying for what you get. Um, I'm guessing the root of that question is from typically when I get that from customers here, you know, I've got half an acre of lawn, you know, how am I going to go come buy 20 bags of that lawn food? I can't spend that much money. Um, if you search out online, um, you know, we'll be EB Stone, probably not Dr. Earth, Espoma. There's a lot of great organic fertilizer companies, but you can find some that probably are a little bit cheaper um, that would have a 50 pound bag or a larger size that might be a little bit more economical for you. Maybe you got a, you know, I wish I had the room. Maybe you got an acre vegetable garden, you know, the same idea, you know, buying little 15 pound bags. Um, you know, you're going to need a lot of them, you know, to, to get a whole acre energized like that. So um, I would search. I don't have a, a local source for that at all. Um, you know, I kind of stay away from anything that's had the municipal waste, the sludge, you know, even though they tell you it's treated, there's some companies up here that will do that. I'll leave that choice up to you. Um, but certainly ju jumping online. I know for a fact um, you can find larger bags of a lot of this, which it would, would be definitely a little more cost effective. You know, we don't get a lot of them here. You know, I have 30 pound bags available for the majority of EB Stone fertilizers. If you want me to, to quote you a price, I'd be happy to tell you how much a 30 pound bag of rose food or roadie food or fruit food or any of that stuff is. Again, if you just need more of it, you know, a pouch, you know, is gonna get you for 12 bucks for a little five pound pouch. You know, the 15 pound bags, 35, you know, a little bit less again per pound. If you want to do it that way, we go to 30. It's even less than that, you know, per pound. So if you if it's that's the solution, we can certainly help with that as well. Good to know. Um, back to the fun ladybugs that we kind of started with. Um, <laughs> so there's question somebody asked and, and I'm curious, too. So, you know, there's ladybug houses. How where do you put those? You know, like how far off the ground do you put them near where you release? How do you attract them to the houses right. so that they stay around a little longer? Well, for a um, location will matter a little bit. Um, and there's a number of different places you can put them in the garden. I think I'd have you just look. There's some great resources online, you know, try it here, put it by this plant. Um, the big thing with those is, is get the attractant too. You know, we have a ladybug a house with an attractant. So yes, when you release them, you know, they'll, again, the insect pheromones are, are, are a good way to go with a lot of this stuff. That's going to tell them, hey, I've got a safe place to come hang out here. Um, and, and get an attractant with your house. You're just hanging the house up. You can have that forever. Just replace the attractant um, each season and you'll still be able to get them, get them there. Gotcha. Um, what about ants? Is there a good organic way to get rid of those or at least reduce their numbers? Yeah, ants will be a little tougher one. Um, 
I don't, I mean, actually, I should look. I don't think I've ever looked on the Spinosad to see if it would do ants. I would imagine it might get them too. I'll check the label if you want to email after the store. I'll do a little investigating on that one. Um, I've never been a, a huge, you know, guy. So, oh, we got to get rid of those ants. My wife would say the opposite thing because she's always complaining about ants and every here and there. Um, you know, a lot of times with me, if they're on the driveway cracks, I'll grab the hose and just kind of wash them to a new place. Um, that helps sometimes too. But um, I'll check. I'll check Spinosad and a couple other things. If you want to email, um, email the store, um, or in the chat room, maybe we can write down our name and number. I'll certainly give you a shout here. I'll I'll do a little 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 checking out for class. Interesting. Nobody's really asked that question, so good job. Yeah, I was like, yeah. see, that's why we love this because one yeah, right? somebody's going to teach me something today. See? Yeah. <laughs> um. So the same kind of vein, but a little bit different. What about rats? Um. You know, we've yeah. talked a lot about moles and voles and things like that, but what about rats? Is there something to kind of deter them or? Well, that you know, I I, I want to state the obvious. There's no magic rat killer or poison that's going to be organic. So I'll start with that, but. I think practices will help, um, you know, look around your house, get rid of places they can hide, don't leave debris, watch where you put your garbage, your food. Uh, bird feeders are a huge one with me personally because I love my birds. I'm not going to quit feeding them, but I've had to kind of stop and start at different times of the year. I found over the years to not get rats climbing up my trees to grab suet down. Um, you know, those may be a little bit, but I would, you know, if you're going to, we're talking organic today, um, you know, I don't know, is traps organic? I guess that would be because we're not using a chemical. So if you don't mind killing them, you could get a trap, certainly. But putting out, you know, baits and poisons and the rest of it, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that leave that up to you. Um, I would look around and see if you could get rid of some of the things they would be attracted of around the house as well. Um, and then again, maybe if you had to catch them, you know, use something natural. You know, you could put some peanut butter on a little rat trap and you'll you'll catch them that way without having to get a little you know, poison pellet kind of thing. Somebody mentioned get a cat, which I thought was pretty funny. Yeah, that works. Or get, get, two, get two is even better. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and, yeah. Don't, and don't keep them in the house all the time. Then they'll have to earn their money yeah, right. outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, what's the shelf life? People, we always kind of get this question about, you know, a lot of these products, um, yep. whether it's fertilizers or yep. some of these, you know, sprays yep. for pests and diseases, what, what kind of shelf life can we expect? So, well, let's take this in twofold. So if we talk about the product side of this, the spinosad, the neem oil, the super insecticidal soap, all the, 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 the pharmacy type products. If I keep that in my garage or a shed that doesn't freeze and doesn't get 90, 100 degrees in the summer, it's not going to go bad. Yes, the, you know, in a decade, yeah, you're probably going to want to start over, but I'm assuming I'd hope you used your bottle up in a year or two and not less than, lost it for a decade. You know, that's part of it is just don't let them freeze. Don't let them get too hot. The fertilizer end, the fertilizers never go bad. The only thing with with organic fertilizers, you probably heard me use that fancy word eight times already, mycorrhiza. So if I have that in my fertilizer, which it will be included in all organics, that population will drop down. So I would never pitch the fertilizer, but you would lose the benefit of the mycorrhiza say, after a year. So if I had a food bag in my garage, I started with X parts per million, it's going to gradually go down with time just because it's been sitting there and you haven't put it back into the soil where it wants to be, but it doesn't mean you throw it away. It's still fertilizer NPK. I just don't have the mycorrhizal part of that down the road. Gotcha. Good to know. But of course, um, don't, don't let it get wet either, please. Yeah. Keep it oh, dry. Right. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so inside, not outside. Sitting there you outside go. Okay. Yeah. Um, so back to a few last few questions here, but back to um, when you were talking about the yard and keeping things natural versus neat. Yeah, sure. um, so if you go the natural route and have, you know, a bunch of leaves left over, do you need yep. to clear those away before you lay a compost or mulch layer on top? No, I, I wouldn't say that at all, because that's probably the benefit of maybe not me, but you being okay with the, the natural look, you know, in the wintertime, let all mother nature drop its leaves, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, I could leave that down. I want to make sure it's probably piled up, not piled up and, and choking the crowns out of certain perennials or buried up on my shrubs a little much, but yes, I could go right down in the spring and add my compost layer three inches deep there. That'll lock all that leaf material down and speed up that decomposition process. And again, it's just more nutrients, more natural into my soil. So you can do it that way. That's what I'm trying 
to do more of here as years go on. So I try to focus on things that I know are slug prone. Maybe I had disease on a plant the year before, a rose. I'm going to get those leaves out of there. I don't want anything diseased, insect, or maybe prone plants left. So maybe I'll clear, you know, a little two, three foot circle where those were. And I don't care about the in-between space kind of thing. That's where I'm at now, instead of just cleaning up every single last thing every single fall, which is what I did for way too many years. So I'm trying to find that balance, neat to natural. There you go. <laughs> Good for you, man. That's that's big growth. It's been a lot of years. Yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I love that, that, you know, just focusing on something small, because I think this is kind of a big, daunting, almost intimidating, you know, subject sometimes. And just like you mentioned in the beginning, starting with something small, specifically if you grow things that you're going to eat, focus on that. And it becomes much easier and just part of your natural routine. And then you can move on to something else in your yard. Yeah. So yeah, that's I mean, great. You, I mean, humans, and I'm at the top of the list for creature habit. I mean, you get into doing something and hopefully it goes into the right way, you're going to keep doing it and you're not even going to have second thoughts about it. But I would absolutely agree with Nicole. I mean, whether it's, you know, okay, I'm going to try this in my vegetable garden. I'm going to try it with my berries. Maybe it's a container garden. You know what? I'm going to plant my annuals in 100% organic soil, use 100% organic liquid food and see the results. You know, I want to try it in this, this little pocket of my yard and see how it goes. You know, and then let the momentum grow. You know, God, that was really easy. I was able to do that. Let me try it here too. You know, and kind of get to that point where, you know, it is or an organic kind of landscape. Yeah, and that feeling of success is really empowering. Um, yeah. You know, then you're more excited to do it again next year or to try something else. So yeah, that's huge. So we talked about amending soil, specifically if you've got, you know, native soil that's clay or sandy or whatever, how do you just need to do that at planting or do you do that? How often do you keep amending your soil? How does that work? Well, if, you know, again, if we're talking about in, in kind of let's, let's go for the shrub beds, you know, or the landscape beds, whatever you want to call it, where I've got tree, perennial shrub, I'm adding plants, I'm taking things out. Um, if I'm starting from scratch, yes, I'm going to rototill that thing. I'm going to add a massive amount of compost and amendments and mix that all up and I'll be good to go, which is what I did, you know, 20 years ago, kind of starting with a clean slate. If it's just a plant, yes, I'm going to dig a really good sized hole, plant that thing. I would always amend like a third compost or any of those hybrid amendments, whichever is the appropriate one with my native soil, mixing that all up and backfilling with that mixture in my soil. Now, yes, am I gonna dig up that shrub and replace those amendments every year? No. That plant's in there to stay. I don't want to mess with it again. But on the surface, I'm going to continue. You know, for me, I use all these Ruby Stone products. I'm walking around in spring, put my rose food down around my hellebore, add another inch or two of compost as a nice little mulch in a ring, lock the fertilizer down. And as that compost continues to work into the soil, it's going to continue to add those same benefits as we did originally. So yes, it, you know, answer the question directly no you're never going to dig that plant up and amend it over and over but i'm going to feed it with that beneficial fertilizer and i'm going to continue to mulch with the compost or an amendment to keep that plant happy long term i don't know um same thing but kind of different you know with raised beds or containers how often you know in terms of amending that soil but how do you ever need to totally change it over do you, is amending well, enough well, i would say in the ground well let's do it this way so in the vegetable situation whether it's a raised bed, the ground, you know, a big area. No, I'm never going to dig up my entire soil bin and throw it away and start over again, unless we got a problem, you know, Houston, we got a problem, then we might have to, but I'm going to consistently amend that every single season. Maybe I plant cool crops now, maybe I do it again in the fall. Yes, I'm going to add more soil booster, compost, whatever my liking is to keep that soil energized. And the container is a little different situation because you do not want tired old potting soil you know that is not going to grow you success so yes you know do i dump every single cubic inch out of my pots every year when i replant them no but i'm digging out old root mass i'm getting rid of plants i'm getting it down to where i'm left with maybe a third of it old soil it's broken up there's no roots it's all ready to go boom now i can top it off with fresh potting soil fresh ultimate recipe and then plant my plants in and off we go again so to me the soil in the yard, you know, maybe the one instance I'm going to keep amending that season to season, or maybe it's twice a year. If you're doing it twice, the potting soil, I'm going to look to replace the majority of it when my plant is done, it's done, and we put fresh soil in there. 
Gotcha. Um, I think we answered them all. As usual, it's amazing the wealth of knowledge that you have. It's a lot to remember. Um, so, you know, some key things I think we talked about a lot are look for those labels, look for those, you know, organic certification things, and also read the labels. You know, a lot of what Trevor talked about, um, when to use, how often, things like that. The labels are always going to be your, your first line uh, to go to in terms of how to use and when and, and you know, and to protect everything around you. Um, bugs, you know, or the good bugs, um, bees, things like that. So, so read those labels and, you know, ultimately if you've got somebody you trust, you know, hopefully if you're close to us, um, you come down and chat with us, you know, ask, ask the professionals, the experts, um, we have a great expert team here that we're, we're not going to steer you in the wrong direction. Um, we have a lot of experience of things we've done in our yards, things that work. Um, and more importantly, we want you to feel the same success growing, um, things is just, is so much fun. We want more people to be able to do it and to not be intimidated by it. So come down, chat with us. Maybe you have a different local nursery. If you're not near us, um, that you trust, go talk to the professionals. That's why they're there. Um, and when questions come up, reach out whether that's in person or through email or whatever, we're here to help um, Sunnyside Nursery at msn.com. Hopefully um, you got that from the end of the slideshow, um, which again is recorded all of this. So you can go back and pause on those slides, write all that information down. There's a lot of good resources there. So um, be sure to utilize the recording if you need to. It'll be up later today um, on our website and our YouTube channel. So we appreciate you joining us. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow for Weed Control again with Trevor. Uh, lots of good information coming for that too. And uh, have a good rest of the day. The sun's just peeking out here. Hopefully we'll see you up at the nursery today. Thanks for joining us.